Take it away, Hi, Gary. Sherry. How are you doing? Well, Sherry is um, one of those people that, like, one in a million, you who uh, has a an issue physically, an issue with their ears, and instead of whining and complaining about it, she made lemonade, and I'm just thrilled to have her here. She is an author. Uh, her and her and her soulmate, her cult, not cult soulmate, but but you know the partner in in uh, in her adventures as far as Harry is concerned. Um, they co-wrote a book that is called Here and Beyond, a skillful, skillfully and let me see, I can't quite see it. My eyes aren't. Right after lunch, I can't see anything. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, at any rate, they, they uh, wrote that her and her Gail uh, Henman, who is uh, she, she and and her wrote a book that was an ultimate survival guide to people that are living with hearing loss. Um, she Sherry holds a. Uh, Bachelor of Sciences in and Psychology at Duke, and I feel a little intimidated. And and <laughs> and an MBA at, at Harvard Business School. So I'm it, that didn't make me feel any better either. So, but listen, I'm really thrilled to have her here, and and uh, we're going to get a lot from this this uh, next hour. So, welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gary. And thank you, everybody, for having me. I'm really excited to spend this time with you. And Gail sends her regrets. Um, but as Gary said, I'm a hearing health advocate and the founder of livingwithhearingloss.com, which is an online community for people living with hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, I'm also the executive producer of We Hear You, which is a documentary about the lived hearing loss experience. And then, of course, the co-author with Gail Hannon of Here and Beyond, Live Skillfully with Hearing Loss. And I'm also one of your patients. So this talk uh, is a little bit different than the ones that you might be used to. It's about the other person, right? The person sitting across from you in the client chair, the one with the hearing loss and how they can create a fuller, more strategic and communication rich life for themselves with your help, of course. And their relationship with you is crucial and a very important part of that journey, which for most of us with hearing loss lasts a lifetime. So the title of the talk this uh, morning or afternoon, I guess, for you guys is Mentoring Your Clients to Live More Skillfully with Hearing Loss. And I don't use the term skillfully lightly because a skill is something you can learn and with practice, it can improve and skills can also be taught. And so we really believe that people with hearing loss can learn to live better with hearing loss. We can become more skillful at it. And no matter where we are on our hearing loss journey, things can get better. And so I've been dedicated to this philosophy for many, many years because I've experienced the life-changing difference that it makes. And so I'm excited to share what I've learned with you so you can turn it um, into insights that you can share with your clients. So everyone with hearing loss, as I'm sure you know, has a story. So I thought I would start with mine because it's always good context for any type of presentation. So my hearing loss began, or I first noticed it really in my mid-20s when I was a graduate student. And pretty quickly into the first semester, I started to miss things in class. You know, maybe it was a comment that someone made under one's breath or as an aside. And sometimes the whole class would just burst out laughing and I would be left looking around, you know, trying to figure out what was so funny. And I knew what the problem was. Uh, I was losing my hearing. My father had developed hearing loss as a young adult, and his mother did as well. And I had been hoping that it would skip my generation, but no such luck. And I was entering a path, you know, really, I felt there was no escape from and one that had destroyed my father's happiness. And, and I was really uh, terrified. 
but I went to get my hearing tested. And I don't remember a lot about that first appointment other than the result, which was mild hearing loss. And I was told that it was too slight of a loss to do anything about, but that I should monitor it. And, you know, honestly, this gave me the perfect excuse to live in denial for many, many years. But as the years passed, I noticed that I was having trouble hearing in meetings and there were certain clients at work and friends socially that I was starting to avoid, you know, the ones I couldn't hear well. So I knew it was uh, time for another hearing test. And as I suspected, this time things had gotten worse and it was recommended that I try hearing aids. And I was really devastated by this. The, the stigma surrounding hearing loss had been very strong in my home growing up. Uh, my father eventually became isolated and withdrawn, uh, you know, really as he tried to hide it from everybody. I remember family events where he'd be just sitting off by himself at a distant table. And one time I asked him, you know, why are you sitting here all alone? And he said, if I you know, if people want to talk to me, they know where to find me. And as a child, I, I didn't really think too much about it. But once I developed hearing loss, I understood the truth. He probably couldn't hear with all the background noise of the party. And he was just too exhausted to keep trying. And knowing how stigmatized he was by his hearing loss, I imagine he was also worried that others might notice that he was having trouble hearing and discover his secret. I'm not sure it was such a secret, but to him, keeping his hearing loss hidden was very important. So these experiences with my father were impacting how I felt about getting hearing aids. And I knew I needed them, but I wanted them to be as small as possible so that nobody would know. I remember getting the hearing aid molds made and uh, it was actually very frightening. You know, I had never put anything into my ears before, right? Let alone this, you know, filling them to the brim with this self-hardening gel. And my audiologist was very gentle, but it was painful. And as the gel hardened, forming the mold, all sound receded and leaving only pressure and fullness. And I wondered, was this how it felt to wear hearing aids? And I just went home and cried. But as my hearing loss worsened, I needed to hear uh, to wear my hearing aids more and more. But still, sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. Um, and I was really following in my father's footsteps of shame and, and isolation. But then I had children of my own and everything really changed because my hearing loss is genetic I worried that I might have passed it on to them. And I saw them watching me hide my hearing loss and being embarrassed by it, just like I watched my father. And I knew I needed to break the cycle of stigma and shame. I finally had to accept my hearing loss. So I did. And I started wearing my hearing aids all the time and working to educate my family and my friends about how they could help me hear better. I started requesting quieter tables at restaurants and using captioning devices. And one year I even rearranged the entire Thanksgiving uh, seating arrangement at my mother-in-law's house. And she was a very good sport about it, but I refused to let my hearing loss isolate me. And it's hard work, but it's worth it. And soon after I turned to advocacy, I'm on the board of HLAA. And there I met other people with hearing loss and began to feel less alone in my struggles. And that's when I started my weekly blog at livingwithhearingloss.com. And then during the pandemic, the documentary and the book. And through my advocacy work, I really hope that I can help others to live more comfortably with their own hearing issues as well. And today I see my children watching me still but this time they're learning the self-advocacy skills they might need should they develop hearing issues themselves. Okay, so each hearing loss journey is unique and th but there are similarities and differences. Um, just because you've been living with hearing loss for a long time doesn't mean you're necessarily good at it. And this was true for Gail Hannon, my co-author and, and me as well. And when we compared notes about our journeys, we realized that over the years and through trial and error, 
And by meeting and learning from other people with hearing loss, we each found our way to a similar set of skills and strategies that help us live well with it. And when we talked about that, what we realized was that when we shifted our goal from hearing better to communicating better, that changed everything. We realized that things would be better if we could just live skillfully. So why are some people more successful than others at living with hearing loss? Um, to individual degrees, we all share the same challenges, right? The same obstacles and the same opportunities to thrive. And it took Gail and I a long time to get where we are because there were few resources for us. But now there are resources and still people struggle. They, they avoid getting help and they get in their own way through negative practices. So why aren't they using, you know, all this fabulous information and technical uh, resources? One of the key influences on how well a person thrives with hearing loss is their life experiences. So the degree and type of hearing loss, uh, their personality, you know, how well do they cope with challenges? How well do they cope with change? How goal oriented are they? How comfortable are they with disclosing and expressing their needs? how well they understand hearing loss is important in general and also their own. And then family attitudes, of course, might have instilled the stigma of hearing loss like I experienced and access to hearing health care, both financially and nearby. A second major influence is the service that you all provide, right? Imagine having a fabulous hearing care professional who is not only a good technician and who communicates well, but who endorses a full range of communication strategies to benefit the client. This has a huge positive impact. On the other hand, many of us have had that audiologist who made us not want to go back or who wasn't sympathetic to our fear of the sound booth or our financial situation and who seemed to simply just want to slap a hearing aid on us. And that too has a huge impact. The third influence is peer resources, which for me and for many people are transformational. Meeting other people with hearing loss helped me feel less alone in my struggles. And it really helped me break down that stigma and taught me so many of the tips and the tricks that I use today to live better. I found role models, I found friends. So the importance of this it really can't be overstated. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right, so what does it mean to live more skillfully with hearing loss? Um, the first step is to know what to expect. And we call that understanding the big picture because if you don't know where you're going, it's pretty hard to get there. The second step is embracing a trio of integrated strategies to improve communication. That includes changing our attitudes about hearing loss, embracing a broad array of technologies, and then non-technical strategies that can be used to improve any listening situation. And the third step is putting it all together, taking what we know about the journey and that stool of strategies and applying it to all areas of life. Okay, so let's look at the hearing loss journey itself. Most of us don't start our hearing loss life with a good view of the big picture. It's, it's really only with hindsight that we even kind of realize we're on a journey, right? The twists and the turns and the stalls and the breakthroughs, all of these are easier to handle if you know to expect them. And it's very helpful when we can learn about the big, big picture from all of you, rather than having to piece it together ourselves over years or even decades for some of us. When we understand the big picture, it lets us see that ups and downs are part of the process. So for example, it takes time to adjust to hearing devices. And if we know that, the fact that they don't work right away is not seen as a failure, but just as a normal part of the process. It's also important to address the emotions of hearing loss. These emotions are normal. Many of us feel sad and angry and you know, maybe even embarrassed that communication now takes so much work. So understanding the big picture shows us that there is help 
and support available. And that asking for this help is not helplessness. It's actually strategic. Now, Gail and I have spent thousands of hours talking with other people with hearing loss. And like I said, every journey is unique, but most of us pass through a series of typical stages. And the first is debating with yourself. And here's where you're wondering if you're having trouble hearing, you know, or maybe everyone else is mumbling. And you probably struggle a lot with denial, looking for anything or anyone else to blame but your own hearing. And this stage can last many, many years for people. The second is validating. And this is where you all come in. So we go for a hearing test and it may not be what we want, but now it's a reality. The third stage is taking charge. And this is really the most exciting part of the journey. And this is where we decide to finally do something about it. And for most people, this means getting hearing aids, but we quickly learn that hearing aids are not a standalone solution. So we explore other strategies, and this is really mostly what Here and Beyond is about, this uh, taking charge phase. Then living skillfully, the ultimate goal. And it might not be smooth sailing every day, but you're equipped to handle the hiccups, try a new strategy, and just keep on going. And then there's refreshing and restarting. And this is what makes hearing loss a journey rather than a puzzle with a finite answer. So something changes, right? Maybe you get new hearing aids, maybe a pandemic hits. Um, something happens that set you back to an earlier part of the journey. And so it begins again. And these stages don't happen overnight. Um, they can last years and we each take the journey at our own pace. All right, the second part of living skillfully is embracing integrated strategies to improve communication. And we call it a three-legged stool because I don't know if people know this, but three-legged stools never wobble, even on uneven ground. And we have not been able to figure out why, but we know that it's true. So this three-legged stool is a solid foundation that really helps people with hearing loss switch focus from hearing better to communicating better. And the three legs are mind shifts, technology, and communication. And each of them is important individually, but when the three of them work together, that's really where the magic happens. I have the potential to change my journey. The person with most power in my hearing loss success is me. I find this to be a very moving statement and really a life-changing one because it's the moment your client discovers that they are in charge of their hearing loss journey. And a lot of that comes down to attitude. As you saw with me, and I think it's pretty common, a hearing loss diagnosis comes with emotional burdens that paint hearing loss as, you know, embarrassing or shameful. And some of these beliefs come from external sources like advertisements and TV shows and other media that still use poor hearing as the brunt of a joke or to make someone appear stupid or foolish or out of touch. And without realizing it, we can internalize these feelings, looking down on ourselves, and this can cause us to hide our hearing loss so we don't appear weak or broken. So let's do an attitude selfie uh, to reveal some common negative attitudes that people might hold about their hearing loss. And these mindsets are in, unproductive and can lead to negative outcomes. And just like the stages of the journey, this list was compiled, compiled from thousands of people with hearing loss that Gail and I meet through our years of advocacy work. So people often think, why me? Nobody understands what I'm going through. I wanna hear better the way I used to. I don't like to advertise my hearing loss. People will think I'm old or slow. My family and friends always forget about my hearing loss. Hearing aids are ugly, expensive, and they don't always work. I don't want to bother anybody with my hearing loss needs. Who would want to hire me or, or love me or be my friend? 
I get angry at myself and others when we make communication mistakes. And everywhere I go, there's no access for people with hearing loss. These, ne these negative attitudes feed into stigma, which can prevent us from asking for the assistance that we need to communicate well. So our attitudes toward our hearing loss really affect our emotions and our behaviors. And so the good news is that life with hearing loss can be better if we can change our attitudes about it. These better attitudes help us have better conversations because we're willing to ask for the assistance that we need. And they can even make our technology work better because we're more open to experimentation and change. So when we can reframe our unproductive, destructive thoughts and reposition them as constructive, actionable statements, we create a healthier approach to hearing loss. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be overly simplistic here, right? Mind shifts are not cures for hearing loss. But when we actively support our hearing aids with other strategies, including an improved attitude, we can communicate better. And this will also improve our working relationship with you. So let's look at a few examples. Okay, here we have the attitude, nobody understands what I'm going through. In the mind shift, many people experience the same challenges as I do. I can learn from them. I'm not alone. So when I first realized I was losing my hearing, I felt so alone. I mean, my father had hearing loss, but he was not going to discuss it with me. And I didn't know anyone else with hearing loss that could you know, commiserate with me or help me understand that there were other ways to live well with it. I got my first hearing aid in 1995, but I didn't meet anyone else with hearing loss until 2010 when I started volunteering at Hearing Health Foundation. And this is 15 years, right, of wasted time. It took me another five to discover Hearing Loss Association of America. And it was life-changing because I finally felt less alone in my struggles. I was now part of a community. I remember my first convention, um, all of a sudden I was surrounded by all these people with hearing loss and I was inspired by so many of them. They were living successful and productive lives and people were music producers, they were entrepreneurs and teachers and volunteers and it just gave me hope that I could live well too. So peer support is something I wish I had learned about at my first hearing care appointment and every appointment thereafter. So please, I'm encouraging you and to encourage your clients to reach out to HLAA or a similar peer support group. Um, it really does have the potential to change their lives um, in the same way as it did mine. The second example has the attitude of, I want to hear better the way I used to. And the mind shift is, I want to communicate better and it takes more than hearing aids to do this. I must use other skills and additional technology. And this really, I think, is the crux of skillful living, right? Shifting that goal from hearing better to, com to communicating better. And one example for me, I think, is the first time I used a speech-to-text app. And it was pretty thrilling because I wasn't reliant on just my hearing to follow the speaker. I had other tools and, you know, the transcription wasn't perfect, right? But it helped. I could follow along more easily and it was just less exhausting at the end of that session. So when we focus on communicating rather than hearing, we have more flexibility and we can learn to thrive. All right, so let's say your clients are all in for these mind shifts, right? But how do you do that? It's not so easy to just change your attitude. So here are a couple of strategies that can help. And the first is to try and optimize rather than perfect. So sometimes perfect is the enemy of the good. And if we can try to shift our goal to making a communication experience better, not necessarily perfect, um, we'll get, uh, we'll, we'll just have a, a better approach to it. Because with the big picture, 
we know it's not always going to be a smooth path and there are going to be challenges. But when we have an open mind, we can try different tactics and try again tomorrow if we need to. The second uh, strategy in terms of shifting your mind is to practice, to build confidence. Uh, and I love to practice things. And I personally like to start with strangers first because I think it's easier. Now, some people say practice with your family or your friends first, right? That's a safe environment. But for me, I think there are higher stakes there sometimes and higher emotions. But the stakes are pretty low with, you know, someone you're sitting next to on the bus or an airplane. So, um, you know, hi, I'm Sherry. I have hearing loss. I may not hear some of the announcements um, that the pilot is making. If there's anything important, you know, please tap me on the shoulder and let me know. And most of the time when we ask for this assistance, it's not what we feared, right? We're not rejected. And most of the time people are pretty help, uh, happy to help us. And the last um, strategy for shifting our mind is to prioritize self-care, <laughs> excuse me. And this is really one of the most important realizations that I had about my hearing loss was the direct relationship that self-care had on my ability to have a positive attitude and acceptance of my hearing loss. So when I meditate regularly, my tinnitus is much better managed. And when I can forgive myself for a hearing boo-boo or an embarrassing situation, they don't weigh on my mind and steal my confidence. I try to practice gratitude every day, eat well, sleep well, live well. And all of these things help me find the humor in hearing loss. They just, they take the edge off and it makes it easier for mind shifts to take hold. Okay, so let's turn now to the second leg of the stool, which is technology. And for many people with hearing loss, technology can be pretty intimidating. You'll probably remember that negative attitude in the selfie, hearing aids are ugly, expensive, and don't always work. And for many of us, all the new assistive technology can be confusing as well. But to secure this leg of the stool, we need to reframe that attitude into something like what you see here. Technology is my friend. My devices let me hear sounds I had forgotten or had never heard before. They connect me to other people and the world. So why are people reluctant to adopt ear technology? You know, I think part of the reason is that people don't always have the right expectations about technology or hearing. Um, we think they're going to be like glasses, right? But they're not like glasses. They don't return our hearing to normal. It's, it's just not possible yet. But this, I think, is what many people expect. And this is what our friends and family expect as well. They just don't know any differently. So I think collectively, we need to do a better job educating potential users about what hearing technology can and cannot do. So hearing aids can help improve speech comprehension, especially in a quiet environment, but they're not gonna be enough in certain situations and that's okay. We need other things. We need branded accessories like remote microphones or smartphone apps like that speech to text app that I was talking about. They even have apps now that alert you to sounds. So if the water's running or if the doorbell rings, and that can be very helpful as well. Uh, external accommodations. Now, I had never heard of CART, you know, where somebody's typing captioning along um, with the speaker or a hearing loop before I was at my first HLAA convention. And, and this is really a huge missed opportunity to get your clients back out to lectures, movies, the theater, you know, really to re-engage with life. So please, um, you know, let them know about external accommodations. And also OTC devices, um, I wouldn't rule them out. I think this is a great entry vehicle for people who may not be comfortable yet um, going for you know, a full-fledged hearing device. And it, at a minimum, it could be a good backup solution in a pinch. So we really recommend Bluetooth um, and until Oracast comes T-coil. 
Uh, I personally think it's a very exciting time to have hearing loss, but sometimes even technology, um, all of this technology is not enough. So that takes us to the third leg of the school of the stool, communication game changers. I want to communicate better, and it takes more than technology to do this. I must use softer skills too. So the third leg of the stool are these softer skills that make communication easier. Many times, even small changes in behavior can have a really big impact on the quality of conversation. And some of these tactics, you know, they might seem obvious, right? But I'll let you in on a secret. They probably are not obvious to your clients, and they certainly were not to me or to my family at the start of my journey. So sharing these softer skills with clients can have a huge and immediate impact on their lives. Things like self-identifying as having hearing loss. This is hard for people. It, it goes against their private nature, uh, but it's critical. Hearing loss is invisible. So if we don't let people know that we're having trouble hearing them, they probably won't know and they won't be able to help. One of our mind shifts is being open about my hearing loss will help me communicate better. Trying to hide my hearing loss leads to misunderstandings. But self-identifying is not always enough, right? People aren't mind readers. So we need to tell them what we need and what we don't need. And the more specific our instructions can be, the better off we'll be. And this goes beyond self-identifying. This is really self-advocacy. And part of this is being comfortable asking for repeats and comfortable asking people to use communication best practices, right? Get my attention first, face me, lights up, noise down, don't yell um, or over enunciate. And our communication partners may not know about these tips if we don't tell them. So education is needed. Uh, and these important tips are extremely easy to forget in the moment. So we, as people with hearing loss, need to get comfortable doing reminders. <laughs> uh, and we have another favorite tool that really pulls it all together. And we call this HEAR. And it's our mental checklist that clients can use to improve any listening situation. It's quick, it's effective, and it really helps you go through uh, and determine what needs to change and how to do that. So the first step is hearing check. Can I understand what my communication partner is saying? And if the answer is yes, then that's great news. But if the answer is no, you move on to evaluate. And this is where you figure out what do I need to do to improve that situation. And these could be environmental fixes, like maybe turning the light up or um, a different seat, but also communication partner issues like louder or slower speech. And this is also a good time to bring out those tech tools and see if an app or an accessory might help. The third step is to articulate. And this is the hardest part, right? But we cannot skip this step. We need to ask for what we need from others. Articulating our needs creates a situation where our partners benefit too. So we, you know, people with hearing loss, sometimes we need to remember that better communication is better for everyone. And then last step is revise and remind. And this is like that refresh and restart in the hearing loss journey, because sometimes things change and adjustments need to be made. made. So like a musician arrives or um, the noise picks up, or maybe people just slip back into their old habits. We can reapply the steps, even if it's just to remind people of what was already suggested. It's simple, it's effective, and with practice, here becomes second nature. My favorite thing is that my uh, children actually have really adopted here. So whenever we go into a new restaurant together as a family, they're helping me figure out what is the right seat for me? Where do I want to be? How should we arrange the family? So here is something clients can do, but it's something that um, their family can help with as well. 
All right. So the final feature of skillful living is taking what you know about the hearing loss journey and that three-legged stool of skills and applying it to all aspects of life, especially that most important area, which are relationships. And hearing loss really slams, you know, its biggest fist into our communication-based relationships. And we have a whole section of our book on relationships and how we can manage them better. So for new relationships, um, there's kind of a filtering process that's unique to people with hearing loss, right? Is it a nice person? Check. Uh, fun to be around? Yes. Okay. Intelligent? Yes. But there's an extra question. Can I understand that person? And if it's not a check, <laughs> we might be in trouble. Uh, but maybe with some skill and some honesty, we might be able to communicate well. But with existing relationships, we don't get to choose, right? Many of us have trouble understanding our family, our friends, our colleagues, maybe our boss. And these people get frustrated with us, but there are ways to make it work. So for example, my family and I have had some pretty uh, charged but rewarding family discussions about my hearing loss to set ground rules, how we're going to behave on hikes, in restaurants, for example. Uh, and in Gail's house, technology really saved her marriage. You know, her husband likes to listen to the TV at one level. She needs it at another level. So she uses a streamer and he can use the normal volume control. And then there are hearing hacks. So everyone's heard about life hacks, right? That their workarounds or tricks for doing something more efficiently or better. And this applies to hearing hacks as well. And we have a hearing hack for almost everything in the book, um, leisure, family events, dining out, exercise, um, you name it. A big hearing hack is to make partners out of the people in our life. And a support network doesn't mean that people are just cheering you on and, you know, listening to you complain. They may also offer tough love and tell you truthfully how you were doing. Now, we can create support networks within our family, our friends at work, and with you, the hearing care professional. You are one of our most important relationships and supports. All right, so now we're gonna to turn to the final part of our talk, which is your role in the successful client journey, that mentoring piece of it. And we're really looking to you to be our partners and our guides as we take on the challenges, excuse me, of hearing loss. And this quote um, from Here and Beyond, I think sums it up really well. The best hearing care professionals are communication specialists who create personalized solutions, including both technology and non-technical strategies. So we're looking for a partnership that includes more than just the hearing aids. And I know after this talk, uh, you will be as well. And both you and the person with hearing loss have roles in this successful journey. So the clinician is the guide, right? Painting that big picture that we talked about, setting appropriate expectations, and all these things show the respect for your client and reinforce your position really as a, a caring partner. So creating personalized solutions is critical. You must take the time to understand the client's lifestyle, communication needs, and really respect their knowledge and their emotions. We are the experts in our lived experience, just like you are the expert in hearing science. Incorporate all types of technology and then reach beyond the technology to include all types of communication game changers. Think about your office. Is it client friendly? <clears throat> You could provide telehealth, so maybe family is easier to participate. Um, maybe have a tablet with auto captioning to help at the check-in counter. And this will let people see that these technologies exist. Also texting and emailing correspondence to make appointments is, is very hearing loss friendly. 
um, sharing information in your waiting area, like books and magazines, um, and pamphlets, maybe from a local HLEA chapter or a peer mentoring group or a lip reading course. And please, of course, provide all important information in writing. Uh, refer to peer resources. Peer support, as I've said many times, is life-changing. Now, people might not be open to peer support at the beginning of the journey. I don't want to go to a meeting with other people with hearing loss, and, um, and that's, that's okay, and that's understandable. But there are peer resources also online that are much more you know, anonymous and sort of lower um, touch. Uh, there are different Facebook groups. There are different... Um, you know, ways to just connect in that way, which lets you lurk around a little bit and, and learn before you can show your face, but it's still supportive in that peer structure. So it's a good way to, I guess, dip toe, your toe into the water if your client is not excited to go to a, a group meeting live. So like I said, all these things will show respect for your client and it reinforces your position as a caring partner. Now, we often get asked, when is the best time to share all this information with clients, right? It, it's hard to fit it in at every appointment. And, you know, it's also hard for clients to absorb all of it, right? It's a lot of information, um, especially at the first fitting appointment. So our advice is really to space the information out over time, right? You can share a little bit at each appointment, share some in your newsletter, or by recommending books or, or those online resources. Um, and you might feel like you're repeating yourself. Uh, you know, we talked about this at the last appointment, but we're gonna talk about it again. And that's okay. The repetition is gonna really help us to absorb that information in a better way. Okay, so we have the person with hearing loss, we have responsibilities also. And if you make your practice client-centered, which I'm sure many of you do, you include your client in the decision-making process. Um, but wherever they are on their journey, getting this information from you might be a new experience um, because collaborative decision-making in the health setting is new. You know, we're maybe used to being told what to do without much discussion. Uh, so you may need us uh, we may need you to help us to do our job. And that is to share our hearing loss journey and our struggles and to be honest about our difficult communication situations, right? This is not time for us to play Mr. or Mrs. Nice Guy or keep a, a, you know, a stiff upper lip. Our job is also to ask questions and to respect your expertise as well as our own and to be open to new strategies. Um, so please ask us about our journey and listen to the answers and ask us about our difficult communication strategies and, and situations. And if our family is there, ask them as well. So the more information that you can draw out of us, um, the better off we will both be in terms of a successful journey. So I want to thank you so much for your attention. Um, I wanted to end with this one last thought. Living skillfully with hearing loss is an ongoing process. And so for each of us, the journey continues. And we invite you to take the journey with us. So I thank you again. Um, for more information on the client journey, please feel free to reach out to me or to Gail with any questions or comments. I have my websites and my email address here. Um, if you're interested in getting copies of Here and Beyond to share with your clients, um, please be in touch. Um, many practitioners have them in their waiting room or they provide one with a hearing aid purchase. And, you know, like we've talked about um, in this book, we've really tried to share everything we know about living the best hearing loss life possible. And we hope you'll find it useful. And we know your clients well. Yeah. So I am happy Thank to do so any much. questions. Yeah. Any questions that you might have? 
Thank you so much. Well, one that I have is, are you, are you willing to share your slides that, that I can share with the attendees? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And then, and then you were talking about having something in the, in, in the clinics. Is it like a, a brochure? Are you talking about the, the book forum or I'm sorry, I missed it. Say that again. I, I missed the first word of your question. You were, you were saying something about having a publication in, in folks clinic. Would it be a brochure mm -hmm. or the book? Itself? Yeah, or absolutely. There's so many things. It could be a book. Um, it could be a hearing loss association, um, prints a quarterly magazine. I think okay. hearing health foundation uh, also prints a quarterly magazine. So any kind of resources like that, um, if there's, I know there's huge, um, HLAA presence in Washington state, yeah. I'm sure they have brochures also about their local um, peer support group. So any kind of, you know, dribs and drabs of information, right? It can, it can be very yeah. helpful for people because you're sitting there waiting and you're thinking and, you know, maybe you're feeling a little depressed that you're here for this appointment. And all of that type of information just makes you feel like you're, you know, not in it all alone, right? You can read stories about other people and, and get helpful um, hints that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sherry, so. I have one comment and I just wanted to thank you for that presentation. It was wonderful. I think that I've been doing a pretty good job, but my sister-in-law recently has begun to wear hearing aids and she is going through the whole thing. I want to hear just like I used to. I know. You know, and I am going to get her this book and work with her on that and get her through her journey. Yeah, I appreciate that. And she'll appreciate that that as well. And, and you know, it's a, it's a book, and, and not just to keep talking about the book, but like it, it, we really wrote it for the person with hearing loss and their family, right? Mm -hmm. Because it gives you a lot of insight into what the person is feeling emotionally and the ways that we need that support um, all around us. And I think people are so willing to help, but they don't know what to do. And sometimes we don't know what to ask for. So um, it can be very helpful. We've actually had lots of people use the book as a book club um, as well, you know, even with like their hearing friends as a way to say, okay, we're going to read this book together. You're going to understand now more about me and we're going to um, see how we can Together. So thank you for being such a good partner for her. Um, I mean, I, I think that's um that's really great. Yeah, I'm gonna read it myself. There's lots that I can learn, I'm sure, from it. Yeah. No, thank I you. I was just thank gonna you. add, um I'm involved with the hearing aid specialist training program here in Washington and have been looking at um courses and um, you know, ways that we can add this type of um, focus to to the training program, um, mm -hmm. primarily because I think, you know, with OTC and with just where we are technology wise, that it, it's just so easy to forget, you know, about the the human element mm -hmm. of, um, of things. And um, you know, a quote, a diagnosis of hearing loss. And probably everybody on this call, either for themselves or a family members, dealt with serious diagnoses, right? And things that really can can set you off on a on a new course in life. And so um we just always have to be mindful of of the language we use and how we interact and and try to better understand, you know. Uh, sometimes we throw big words out and sensory neural this and that, and um, all of that can be very scary for people who um, who are just coming to us, you know, for the first time. So I think th this is absolutely fantastic. And um, my takeaway is to see if if how we can integrate more of this into our training program. Mm -hmm. I yeah, absolutely. That. I agree. There's a, there's a psychological component when you when you have, you're dealing with the the human aspect. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's one of our major goals, actually. So, is 
really yeah, getting my mind into the, the educational process for sort of up and coming audiologists and hearing mm -hmm. specialists, because, yeah. um, you know, I know there's oral rehab that's discussed, but this piece of it, um, you know, I think is, is underemphasized, as you said, in terms of, of that training. So yeah, we're, we're always willing and, and excited to speak with students as well. So keep that in mind if that's helpful. That's great. Anyone else have any questions or comments? All in agreement. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And you, uh, you know, you identify as a, a, a hearing advocate, and um, um, absolutely everything you've you've done and presented is that's what you are. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Bye, guys. Have a great rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.